this jet? Um, a couple of points. One, uh, I said before the short adjournment that the parliamentary uh, resolution, the parliamentary assembly resolution, I think you referred to in case law, uh, 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 we've looked again over the short adjournment and it is referred to, you may have picked it up being referred to in paragraph 125 of the sterilisation of the French case, where the parliamentary assembly was one of the myriad of bodies that had come out against sterilisation, if I can put it that way. So the relevant paragraphs in uh, the French case are paragraphs 125, and for what the um, parliamentary assembly said about sterilisation in that case, see paragraphs 74 to 75. Turn to Article 14. Um, and I'm not going to say anything beyond what's in our written argument about ambit, other status, or difference in treatment. <coughs> other status, we do respectfully agree with my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson, which is that uh, uh, it's in a vanishingly small category of cases that other status actually goes the other way. And the, 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 the circumstance in which it has done. Uh, uh, as, as far as I recall, have been pretty much restricted to the type of situation you had in Stott in some of those earlier cases to do with convicted murderers and so on. But uh, I'm not going to make any submissions about any of that. Uh, the justification question is the is the um, is the interesting one in, in relation to Article 14. And I've already made my submission that margin and the approach to margin applies equally in our context. To Article 14, and you'll recall that I made the submission about margin on, on the back of a, 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 of a submission that um, it would be incoherent if the position were otherwise, and drew your attention to the fact that at least some of these cases are analysed as Article 8, some of these cases are analysed as Article 8 stroke 14, so it would be pretty incoherent if the position were otherwise in, in our particular context. And we do respectfully submit, therefore, that that approach in principle applies both uh, to margin and also to the question of whether or not there should be strict scrutiny. The approach is the one I've been through already, based centrally around Hammerlein and the Grand Chamber, Para 67. And our analysis of that, I'm not going to go back over that. We make the additional point in relation to strict, strict scrutiny that there's nothing to support strict scrutiny in the context of Article 14 and the case law anyway, even in the context of transsexuals. See the cases cited in our skeleton at paragraph 50, 5 0, where we cite PV and Spain and note that they didn't set a, a, a strict standard of review in PV and Spain, see paragraph 30. I'd invite you to turn it up. It's in tab 37 of Authorities B if you want it. We are agreed with the uh, claimant that uh, what has to be justified is not the measure at issue but the difference in treatment between one group and another. Bill Bingham's famous statement in A and the Secretary of State for the Home Department. And nothing in Lord Kerr in Steinfeld amends that statement of principle. But here, the short and obvious point is that there is a very, very close link indeed, if not an entire overlap, between the Article 8 issues and the Article 14 issues, for the simple reason that you're asking essentially whether um, there should be an obligation to include, as it were, the uh, non-gendered, non-binary cohort in the MF treatment. And that's <coughs> the same essential question under 8 and under 14. It's to be borne in mind in relation to Steinfeld, which you have behind uh, A2 tab 20, if you need it, but that distinguished between two categories of situation. Uh, firstly, where the <coughs> form of discrimination had been historically justified, but over time that historic justification had gradually lost its force. 
as compared to the situation which uh, um, had occurred in Steinfeld, where the state itself had introduced, through the passing of legislation, the state itself had introduced a new form of discrimination that had never been justified. The position here, we submit, is, is, is neither of the above. <laughs> but we, we submit that the justifications that the judge relied upon are legitimate justifications. They are, in essence, the combination of coherence and security considerations. And there's nothing in the coherent set of arguments that is analogous to, still less to be equated with, the perjurative, perjuratively described in Steinfeld wait and see policy. And that is because in the Steinfeld situation, as I've indicated, it was accepted throughout that something had to be done about the new form of discrimination that had been created. And the discrimination was not on its face, as it were, justified in that way. So wait and see was the only answer. Here, what is being thought about is the coherence of a regime, whether the consensus has moved, whether we're under a positive obligation and all of that. Well, in the sense of Stanford, there was only one thing that was either going to be done or not done. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so. and plus the fact that, as I say, I mean... The argument that was run was, you, you can't hang us for doing something which is beneficial than in advance, as you've seen from the case, in terms of equalities and so on. But the, 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 the irony that underpins Steinfeld was that by having taken that progressive step, we had created a whole new and unjustified <laughs> set of distinctions. So, um, but that is very different to the position we're in here. The question here is whether we've moved to that to that place where we've run out of rope in terms of uh, consensus and all of that. So, so, so we do respectfully submit that there's nothing analogous. We can't be equated to the, to the wait and see uh, situation in Steinfeld. There are a lot of serious and difficult related questions about how far society should move and all of that. So we respectfully submit that that's a very different situation. And for that reason, the base situation uh, is essentially exactly the same and raise exactly the same issues under justification as arise under Article 8. <clears throat> In any event, uh, e even if we were to be uh, beyond that realm and the clock has ticked far enough or you draw an analogy with whatever, um, uh, the, we are not still in a comparable situation to the one in Steinfeld, we are, if anything, closer to the one that was being considered in Hooper, where the historic justification runs out over time. And the significance of that, or just highlighting that as an in any event point, it, it is the obvious one, which is that in that situation, you do have a period of time to put matters, to put matters right, and to think about how precisely you're going to do that. That's all I wanted to say about discrimination. And just to be fair to the learned judge, it is right to point out, I think my learned friend entirely fairly acknowledged, that the argument below was very much on Article 8, with Article 14 not really adding much on either side's argument. And it's been given a few more legs, if that's the right way of putting it, because Steinfeld happened post uh, the judge's decision here. Relevant and irrelevant considerations my one-sentence submission is that the judge was right for the reasons that he gave. And that this, in truth, adds nothing to the key arguments around the Convention, in particular Article 8. But if my learning friend has a virtuous concern about the state of public law, my short answer in relation to that is that this is a continuing policy which is under challenge. 
and it therefore falls to be justified as such as a continuing policy. It is in theory possible, I suppose, for there to be a continuing policy which has had historic effects where it may be relevant to examine whether or not at the time you took into account irrelevant considerations or whatever, but we're simply not there and, uh, and the judge was right to treat it as a continuing policy capable of justification on present grounds. So we submit that that adds nothing. <clears throat> and that leaves only the cross appeal on costs. That's dealt with in our skeleton between 59 and 66. And the issue is whether or not the judge was uh, correct and justified in making a reduction of a third to the capped costs. In this case, the numbers are very small, but the principle may be of some broader significance. And the issue of principle, in essence, is whether or not in a case in which the court decides that there should be an issue reduction, if I can describe it in that way, of, say, a third, that third should be made and come off total costs or the capped amount. And our submission, for the reasons we've developed in writing and we've given you all the background, I hope, legislative and other case law materials in the skeleton. Our submissions for the reason there set out is that the correct approach is to approach the cost cap as imposing a limit on the liability of a claimant to pay amounts that would otherwise be due. But to approach At all points up to that, to approach the question at all points up to that, on the basis that the cap is left out of account, so you work through the amounts, you work through reasonable and necessary and so on, you work through the percentage reduction, you arrive at a figure and then you do it. That's, that's the submission that we make. And, and I make three short submissions in support of that being the correct position. The first is that that is, we submit, a more faithful reflection of what the cost cap is doing. It is protecting a claimant in relation to the maximum they may have to pay, but it, doesn't, it isn't otherwise altering the approach to costs. The cap was not designed, in effect, to play a part in the prior functional analysis as to how costs should work in a particular case. It is and should be a cap and no more. That's the first submission. Second submission is that if it's approached in that way, it entirely and properly reflects and protects the relevant public interest which is in play. And that is because it allows still a claimant to have the comfort that they will not have to pay more than X, even if they lose. Would it not have the effect that, particularly where, as in this case, the cost cap is a very low thing compared with the real costs inevitably injected in a case like this, would it not have the effect that the cost that the party benefiting from the cost cap will be in the cap is liable to pay all of the costs up to the level of the cap unless they get absolutely every issue. Uh, it does have that effect. It does have that effect, but it still it still serves the function it serves. There may be cases where the cost cap is significantly higher. Um, the one can quite envisage, I mean, we've had lots of cases in which the cost cap is set reciprocally on 65,000 or 50,000 or whatever it may be. But you, I, I entirely accept that it is a function of the argument that I, that I advance, that in those very low 
cap cases, that is indeed the effect. I still maintain the submission, my second submission, which is that the, the public interest remains protected because the cap is still the cap. It's operating as the <coughs> maximum cap that you... The, 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 but the, a discretionary approach would enable the judge out here to reflect the positions of the parties and the outcome, perhaps in a more nuanced way than the, than the operation... Well, my Lord says in a more nuanced way, we respectfully submit that it would be in a more double-counting sort of way. Uh, and it leads me to my third submission. So the second submission is that the public interest is properly and entirely protected because you've still got the maximum. You can make litigation decisions knowing you're not going to have to pay more than 3,000 or 50,000 or whatever it may be. But the third one is that it doesn't impinge or make a significant inroad into the other public interest in play, which is that it is the taxpayer who normally bears the residual costs of a successful defence. And that impacts, so it doesn't sound like too parochial a submission, that impacts more directly on MOJ budget, the spending envelope which is available for justice, if you will, and thereby isn't just a broad taxpayer point. It's a point that could well have significant ramifications, or may have significant ramifications, for the, for the beneficial side of that, which is legal aid, and you know, if you rob Peter, you have to pay Paul. So there is a public interest that is in play on the other side, which is taxpayer slash maintaining MOJ budgets for, for, for that sort of thing. So that's, I think, the substance of the answer to the point my Lord, my Lord makes. Um, th th there is one case in the bundle, which I can show you very, very briefly. It's a very recent Court of Appeal case. And that is in uh, bundle A2, tab 27. <coughs> Which is the campaign to protect rural England against the Secretary of State and Mason Barrett. And um, this was about Aarhus, so this was an environmental case, and the real question was whether or not a cost cap had been set, as you see from, it's an Aarhus cost cap, as you see from paragraph three, fourth line, claim report gets issued, appellant requested, that's the claimant, requested that its cost liability be limited to 10,000 in accordance with CPR part 45, that's the Aarhus cap. Uh, that request was acceded to, see the second line of paragraph four. And then what happened was that there was a, a split of costs three ways when permission was refused. And in the end, a £10,000 limit was reached and £10,000 had to be paid and it was split between the three defendants. And you see the argument with which we have got some analogy, at least in paragraph five. So, although some final sentence or <coughs> suggestion the costs were excessive, the main argument on quantum was that it was wrong in principle for costs at the permission stage to absorb the entirety of the Aarhus cap. So you can see the argument developing. It's 10,000 quid for the whole litigation and why we're having to pay that amount. Or anyway, so you see, <coughs> see, we're saying, see how the argument is put. And the relevant uh, paragraphs for present purposes are paragraph... Uh, well, you see the summary of their conclusion at paragraph 41. <coughs> the judgment is given by Lord Justice Coulson, with whom... Uh, Lord Justices David, David Richards and Hamlin agree. And you see in 41 the conclusion in the second sentence, more broadly, three, four lines into it, I reject the suggestion once the court has identified the reasonable and proportionate costs of the successful defendants who are interested party following the refusal of permission, and those costs are in total uh, below the Aarhus cap, but the cap should nevertheless be deployed as a further means of reducing the costs. <coughs> 
so that you see the analogy. And then the, the analysis which supports that, the key bits, are really in uh, paragraphs 50 to uh, halfway down 53. Could I invite the court just to read those paragraphs? So paragraphs 50 through to about halfway down 53. taking it, as it were, reading backwards, you see the, the public interest advantage that I referred to about the maximum. My second point reflected in that uh, third and fourth sentences of paragraph 53. And, and you see, in essence, the guts of it from my perspective, for the purpose of these submissions, is really that second half of paragraph 51. And there's no re reason to limit the recovery by means of a further arbitrary cap and so on. So, the analogy is there, at least. I don't say this is a direct authority, but it's it's rather approaching it on the basis that you do the cost analysis, yes. you leave everything else out of account, and then the cap comes in, and it fulfills its public interest objective. So I suppose you would say, in this case, as in that one, really, the counter-argument is based on the false premise that the cap represents, as it were, a notional total cost of the proceedings. In, it, exactly it's so. nothing of the sort. It's just, a, it's just a cap on the amount you may actually have to pay at the end of the process. That's what I rather inelegantly described as not using it as part of the functional analysis. You can say it creates the brave new world, but here's the game that you're now playing with, which was the point that my Lord, Lord Justice Irwin was putting to me, with my answers are the ones I've given. Particularly that, that, that those flip sides of the public interest, protecting the claimant so that you don't stifle useful public interest litigation that should be tested before the courts completely and sufficiently achieved, but nevertheless, you allow the cost thing to run and the cap comes in simply as a cap and operates in that way, and that allows for the other side of the public interest, which is not saddling the taxpayer, or more accurately, the MOJ and its tight legal budget anyway, which is used for thoroughly useful purposes as well. Uh, you don't unduly saddle them with uh, that excessive or residual liability. So that's how we put the argument on costs. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Yes, Mr. Malford. Mr. Malford, can I? Was it you that um, gave us the references on the chronology? Um, yes, my lady. Uh, those sitting behind me um, assisted um, in doing those. We then uh, checked those and um, gave the junior accounts. Well, thank you they very are, much. We also have the uh, references to the additional evidence that we served by the Secretary of State. Well, that was most helpful. I'm grateful to those of you that made that happen overnight. Thank you. Yes, now, you're going to deal with the cross appeal. Right? I, I am, my lady. Um, my lady, I have four, my lords, I have four points to make. Um, they are, first of all, by reference to the terms of the order. Uh, secondly, by reference to the general discretion as to costs under CPR Part 44. Thirdly, as to consistency with principle. And four as to the lack of unfairness. Can I deal first then with that first topic, the terms of the order? Um, if the court uh, takes up Paul Bundle at tab 15A, Tab are we at? Uh, it's tab 15A, my lord. 15, thank 15 you. A. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, yep. <coughs> so, this was a consent order that was agreed between the parties and was approved by the court. So, what was the date of the order, please? Uh, so, the date of this order is um, 
the 12th of October 2017. Thank you. That's the date, that's the date of the stamp. And uh, this was the order which instituted um, a camp. And <coughs> if my lady and my lord have been a second or third recitals, you'll see that this was in compromise of the cost capping order application that had been made within the uh, summary grounds. And it was a mirror cap limiting costs so that neither party may recover costs of more than the amount set out in the order. So, as we set out at paragraph 70A of our skeleton argument before this court, that uh, order made no express provision and indeed gave no indicators that any reduction in costs that might be ordered should be applied to the total incurred rather than to the capped amount. It's simply silent on that issue. And therefore, the, the judge below correctly recorded a paragraph 12 of his judgment that the Secretary of State had acknowledged, uh, as the Secretary of State had, in the submissions that were provided to the court um, on cost and on permission to appeal after judgment uh, came down, that the Secretary of State had acknowledged that the court still retained a discretion as to whether and to what extent any order for cost should be made under CPR Rule 44.2. So there was no anticipatory uh, resolution of this issue by the parties and it was accepted before the judge below to be a matter for the discretion of the court. So we say, my Lord Mary, that that alone is a basis upon which the court may dispose of the appeal. Uh, that it was a matter for the court's discretion and the court exercised that discretion. We say there are uh, no basis to disturb that discretion. May I then move on to talk about the, the breadth of that discretion which was being exercised? And it is important, my lady and my lords, just to look at the uh, regime. I know that the court will be well aware of it, but just to highlight certain parts of CPR Part 44.2, that's in Volume 1 of the White Book, at page 1355. First of all, at Rule 44.2, brackets 1, the court will see that there is a general discretion, a very broad and flexible discretion, as to whether costs are payable at all, and if so, in what amount, and indeed, as to timing as well. Now, at Rule 44.2, brackets 2, it provides that there is a general rule that costs will follow the event, but that the court may make a different order, and that's 44.2 brackets 2b. Now, I pause there to say that that, of course, is what has happened in this case. The court has determined that it's appropriate to depart from the general rule, and it's done that by ordering that a stated sum of £2,000 be paid, and it arrived at that by applying a 33% reduction to the maximum cap to reflect the fact that the judge had found against the Secretary of State on the important issue of the engagement of Article 8, and, of course, there's no challenge to that conclusion. Now, my lady, the reasons that a court may depart from the general rule abroad, and if the court looks down at Rule 44.2, 4 and 5, sub 4 and sub 5, that includes uh, conduct. And those conduct considerations include whether it was reasonable to raise and pursue an allegation. They include the manner in which the case was pursued. They include matters as to exaggeration. So we say that there are a multiplicity of reasons why a court should have a broad and uh, unfettered discretion in order to, except by reference to the factors that are identified, look at what is an appropriate cost disposition uh, in the round. And uh, my learned friends at paragraph 63 of their skeleton argument, we say, are wrong to say that Rule 44.2 as a whole starts with the premise that the successful party gets its costs subject to deductions. The court's powers are much more flexible than that, and they're much more flexible than that for good reason. Now, we say at paragraph 70b of our skeleton argument that the, the compensatory aim, the general compensatory aim of cost provisions, have already been subsumed in this case, in the case of cost caps, to a superior interest, and that superior interest is the access to justice in public interest proceedings and the rule of law considerations in those important public law claims, issues of general public importance, getting to the courts and not being stifled on account of the fact that the people who 
are affected by them and wish to bring them, or indeed for the person within an affected class uh, does not have the means to do so. Uh, that then brings me on to the third of my topics, which is the question of consistency, of consistency with principle. The, the cost capping order regime is that provided for sections 88 to 89 of the Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015. That's in Authority Bundle C at tab 54. statutory regime, although not identical to the previous judge-made uh, protective cost order regime, is very substantially in the same form. And just looking at, at section 88, uh, you'll see there are certain features to highlight. First of all, at 88, um, one, uh, 88 sub 2, a cost capping order is a, an order limiting or removing the liability of a party in judicial review proceedings to pay another party's costs in connection with any stage of the proceedings. Uh, three, the court may make a cost capping order only if leave to apply for judicial review has been granted. Looking down the page at six, the court may make a cost capping order only if it is satisfied that the proceedings are public interest proceedings. And that in the absence of the order, the applicant would withdraw the application and be reasonable in doing so. And there's a gloss on what public interest proceedings are at sub seven, which is issues of general public importance where the public interest requires those issues to be resolved and the proceedings are likely to be an appropriate means of doing so. And turning over the page at 8, we can see that the matter is to support the South Guard in determining whether that public interest proceeding test is satisfied include the number of people likely to be directly affected and the significance of the effect. Section 89, uh, the matters which the court has to have regarding considering whether to make the order and the terms of that order include the financial resources of the parties to the proceedings, the extent to which the applicant uh, is likely to benefit, uh, sub D, 89 1D, whether the legal representatives <coughs> for the applicant for the order are acting free of charge, and whether the applicant for the order is the appropriate person to represent the interests of the person to the public interest generally. So we say that looking at this regime as a whole, the first and the main purpose of creating a cost capping regime, as with the protective costs order regime, which it's superseded, is to facilitate access to justice and the determination of important public interest law challenges. So where at um, paragraph 64 of the Secretary of State's skeleton argument, it's argued that the judge's approach was contrary to the principles of cost capping. And then to summarise the paragraph 61 of the respondent's first argument, um, most of those we don't take any issue with. But we say the primary reason for the regime is to facilitate access to justice and law, ensure it's important public interest come to court. But we do take some issue with the characterisation of paragraph 61, Roman 4 uh, of my learned friend Skelton's argument that they, it's pursuing some measure of fairness. But we do accept that the legislature has decided to proceed on the basis of principle of reciprocity. But this is not a, this is not about um, fixing the costs. We say it's about it's about limiting them or, or subjecting them to a cap. So um, the Secretary of State says at paragraph sixty four that the judge's approach was contrary to the principles of cost capping, and the reason that's given is that the cost cap does not preclude a successful party from incurring costs that exceed the cap. Well, of course that's right, but it's a non sequitur. I've already addressed that the compensatory principle has yielded to the superior policy aims in this context, and the judge's analysis below was not that it was inappropriate for costs to be incurred above the cap, um, but that it was appropriate in the exercise of his discretion um, to make a, a reduction to, to fix those at the sum of £2,000. And we said it would be wrong for the cap to be considered to be an invariable flaw of costs that were ordered. 
And, and my lady, my lords, one does need to consider the practicalities of this because the respondent's approach will be burdensome both to the court and to the other party who's likely to be acting, uh, whose legal representatives are likely to be acting pro bono. Because the, the costs cap in this context, and this is what happened below, removes the need to produce and argue over incurred costs. So in this case, the, the respondent never provided the judge below with a total of the respondent's incurred costs. Um, so what the uh, respondent's approach would require is that before the court considers whether or not to make an order of the costs follow the event, or whether to use the discretion to make some different order, the cost schedule should be provided of all of the incurred costs. If the court then considers that it's appropriate to depart from the principle that costs should follow the event, the court should first of all have reference to the incurred costs, and only then secondarily should it consider the, question, the cost cap. We say that that's adding a significant amount of burden, and there's really no warrant for requiring that. Of course, it might be that it's, it, it's, it's argued for as a discretionary matter, but to say that as a matter of principle, that is what must be done, we, we say there's simply no warrant for that. that. That brings me on to the fourth and last of my submissions, which is the lack of unfairness. Well, we say that contrary to paragraph 65 of the respondent skeleton argument, there is nothing unfair about the judge's uh, approach below. And there's two points to make in relation to that. The first of that is the pressure on uh, claimants to bring to agree mirror caps. And the second is the uh, argument as to a lower cap. Now, at paragraph 13 of our submissions below on costs, uh, I don't need to take the court to it, but just for the court to know, these are... Uh, tab 24 of the core bundle. We made the point that the original uh, application for a cost capping order was made within the, the summary ground, within the detailed grounds of, of claim. And it was made on the basis that the claimant in this case is a member of the affected class, the outcome of which uh, this litigation will be of comparable significance for the class as a whole. But the claimant was an appropriate person to bring this claim because of the it's a legitimate interest in the subject matter and long-standing engagement with the government in respect to this issue. But the claimant's financial position was very precarious. The claimant was unemployed, and indeed, as all we have seen from the witness evidence to be filed, the claimant has had great difficulties in the course of the claimant's, uh, of the applicant's uh, life, with employment often uh, arising from uh, the applicant's non-gendered status. So the applicant was in the position of somebody who was unemployed, with limited financial means, uh, with a partner who would, was to be supportive, who was a resident blind person, and that had only been able to bring this claim because the claimant had been able to uh, secure pro bono legal representation. And what the claimant sought in that application was uh, a, protect, a cost capping order, which was removing the liability to pay costs or alternatively limiting it to £3,000. And the defendant opposed the application of the cost liability relieved and only proposed to agree a mutual limitation of £3,000. And there's an important uh, point here as to why this places the claimant in an invidious position. The, 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 the sections that I, I've shown in the court, as I said, embody the, in large terms, the protective costs of the regime. And if I could just ask the court to take up um, the corner house case, this has been added. Uh, at the end of um, volume A2, it should be tab 28C in the court's bundles. And this was the guidance, which is the authority guidance provided by Lord Phillips and Marshall of the Rollins in the corner hands case. And these principles continue to be cited to the court in the context of cost capital cases because it is largely an embodiment of that judge made regime. Give me a moment, would you? Right. I've got 28 C. Loose, loose. It, it, it should have been yeah. handed up, my lord, with a, the coloured tab in front of it. Um, oh, in, oh, sorry, here we are. Yep. Criteria which are embodied in the statutory regime. 
Court said is that the application for a protective cost order should, in normal circumstances, be sought on the face of the initiating claim form, and the application should be supported by evidence. Mm -hmm. um, that is reflected uh, now in the statutory context, uh, both by paragraph 10.2 of Practice Direction 46, and if I can just give the Court the reference to that, it's White Book, Volume 1, page 1539, and also to section 88.3 of the statutory scheme, which I've already shown the Court, which is that a cost capping order may only be made if leave to apply for judicial review has been granted. Now, what the Court continued to do at paragraph 78 was to give guidance uh, as to what cost liability a claimant might face if they made an application for a protective cost order and that was resistant. And so, turning over the page, the Court said, the cost incurred in resisting a protective cost order should have regard to the overriding objective in the peculiar circumstances of such an application. The coverability will depend on normal tests of proportionality where appropriate necessity. We would not normally expect a defendant to be able to demonstrate that the proportion of costs exceeded a thousand pounds. So that gave to public law claimants a great measure of reassurance that if they applied for a protective costs order, if that was resisted, as it invariably was, uh, by the Secretary of State, uh, then their maximum liability was that it was a known sum and it was a, a, a sum of a thousand pounds. But the lacuna that was created and has, has never since been addressed, unfortunately, is that because the application for the protective cost order is made on the face of the originating claim, and because the uh, respondent is required to file acknowledgement of service with the summary grounds, and is in principle entitled to the costs of those summary grounds if permission is refused, is that the consideration of the protective cost order and the consideration for them to give permission to seek judicial review are given at the same time. And the court has never given any guidance as to the reasonable limitation on the costs which a claimant may face uh, if permission to appeal is refused. So in a situation where an application for judicial review is made seeking protective costs order, permission is resisted, and they, maybe a PCO is resisted, the claimant knows that absolutely extraordinary circumstances, they will only face a thousand pound liability in respect to the refusal of the protective cost order, but they have no idea of knowing what cost liability they face in respect of having, uh, uh, of the respondent's costs, or having the defendant's costs, or having uh, resisted the commission. And so practically speaking, what that means is that uh, where a defendant comes and says, well, we'll agree a mirror cap, uh, the claimant is in no position to pursue what they actually wanted, which was to be relieved of the cost of burden by reference to their financial circumstances, because uh, there is an indeterminate liability in respect of um, in respect of the sums they may pay um, for permission. So we say that in those circumstances, um, although the application for the cost capital order was made by reference to the means, the court can't simply say, well, the mirror cap that was agreed is also a perfect reflection of those means because it also reflects the fact that the claimant is in an invidious position if they take that through to wait for that to be determined by the court. And, and so we say in those circumstances that, the, it, it, that it is fair that the sum, the cap, is treated as a maximum amount of liability and not a de facto liability and that the court has a discretion. And indeed, taking my Lord, Lord Justice Irwin's point that uh, in circumstances where a um, respondent, a uh, defendant, had been found to have um, uh, raised issues which it ought not to have done so, and indeed to have pursued those in an improper way or to have exaggerated matters, those are matters where we say that it would be uh, a, a wrong result where having had the burden of dealing with all of those issues, the court having had the burden of dealing with all of those issues unnecessarily, there is no consequence in terms of costs at the end of the day. We say that's a matter which should be reflected in the uh, discretion of the courts. And then in relation to the second point, that the, the Secretary of State argues that um, it's an unfair approach, this is paragraph 65 of the Respondent's Skeleton Argument, because it leads to a lower cap being imposed. We say that's simply wrong. The cap is the same, but in the exercise of its discretion, the court has not award, determined to award the full amount of the, uh, uh, of the cap. And we say, for those reasons, such as conduct, such as considering the balance of success on the issues, uh, that is uh, something which is appropriate and something which also supports not just the interest of fairness of the claimant, but the proper administration of justice and the court uh, has an ability uh, to do that. Um, finally, in relation to the case that my, that my friend refers to, the CPRE case, um, we of course accept 
cat is in the nature of a, an, a sort of arbitrary figure by reference to the total cost which may be uh, incurred. But really the issue then is, is one about stages. And there was an argument in that case that, uh, well, we can say that you know, this is referable in broad terms to the whole litigation. And if it only gets as far as permission, then we can start to, uh, we can start to splice it and dice it. We understand that that is an unattractive position. Um, but we say that case simply has no uh, general application to the issues before this court now as to whether there was anything uh, in principle was wrong with the exercise of discretion by the judge below. Unless I can assist the court further. No, that was very clear and helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my lady, I'm very grateful to Mr Mountford for dealing with ground two of the Secretary of State's cross appeal. May I start my reply by dealing with ground one? That is found in the core bundles, tab two, page 25. is that the Court of Appeal should uphold the judge's decision for a further reason not given by the judge. And that is that the Secretary of State says that the judge erred in law by finding that Article 8 of the Convention protects a right to identify in a gender other than male or female. And that reference 107 108 of the paragraphs, of course, of the judgment below. The Secretary of State's position is that there is no decision of the European Court of Human Rights, holding that Article 8 protects the right to identify as non-gendered, as opposed to identify as trans. Just pausing there, the right in relation to identify as trans has always been, as Mr Eady has been at pains to point out, to identify in the opposite binary gender to that of the birth of the trans person. There is no separate right to identify as trans. The Secretary of State goes on to say that the decision, that is the judge's decision, results in an interpretation of Article 8 that finds no support in the um, Strasbourg jurisprudence and the decision of the judge is contrary to the mirror principle. There is nothing in that ground of appeal to suggest that the Secretary of State uh, seeks, makes some distinction between the engagement of Article 8 when it comes to a positive obligation or when it comes to an interference, the negative obligation, if you put it in that way. When I pointed out yesterday that the Secretary of State's position is that Article 8 protects only those who identify as male or female, which is an entirely, in my submission, accurate reflection of the first ground of the cross appeal, the court was, in my submission, not unsurprisingly rather taken aback by that position and suggested that the point couldn't seriously be in doubt. And in response to the court's question to him, Sir James indicated that his position was more nuanced. What has become clear during the course of the submissions today, on behalf of the Secretary of State, is effectively that the Secretary of State wishes to avoid answering that direct question posed by her own cross-appeal. On behalf of the Secretary of State, Sir James accepts that gender identity is protected by Article 8. It is difficult to see how he could not. He accepts that it is recognised in the jurisprudence of Strasbourg in a broad sense. But not once in the course of his submissions did Sir James accept that gender identity in the form of non-gendered identity was protected by Article 8. The highest it was put is that this court cannot jump to a conclusion 
that the principle in cases such as Van Cook apply to non-gendered persons. But the Secretary of State is asking this court to find that that principle does not apply to such persons. It is simply not enough to say you shouldn't jump to a conclusion that it does. Rather, there ought to have been an argument in support of the grounds of appeal, which are not abandoned, to say why Van Cook does not equally apply to a non-gendered gender identity. When pressed, he says, well, you still have to apply the three factors. That is, in his order, consensus, impact on the state, and then impact on the applicant. And he says, though, that there, there are difficult issues and different issues to be thought through. But you only get to consideration of those three factors if Article 8 is, in principle, engaged. And that is why I took the court to those cases where the Court of Appeal, a book, rather, the Strasbourg Court, does consider specifically the engagement of Article 8 before going on to consider whether a positive obligation arises and how to proceed. Uh, this matters for two reasons. Uh, one is, in the absence of having withdrawn the cross appeal, this court needs to determine that issue. Our position is simple. The judge below got this completely right. And this court should make it absolutely clear that non gendered persons, such as the appellant, and others whose gender identity is not either male or female, are protected under Article 8. The second reason is that it is against this background where the Secretary of State has herself appealed to say that such people do not have rights under Article 8 asks this court to take into account ongoing consideration of these issues and that, as they put it, the matter is under consideration and the approach is not based on never but not now. There is nothing to stop the government simply concluding that actually nothing should be done because the government's position is persons who do not identify as either male or female do not have rights under Article 8. While dealing with the position of the appellant, I move to the first of the factors uh, that Mr. E.D. Sir James identifies as being the three relevant factors. I, I pointed out in Goodwin there are four. There's also medical and scientific considerations. I also pointed out there isn't, a, as it were, a priority given to consensus. It appears third in the list. It is no more key than the other issues. He accepts that the impact on the individual is a relevant... Sorry, just before you go on to that, your priority point. Yes. It is, is the appellant's position then that the four, three factors uh, have... There is no priority. It's wholly dependent on the circumstances of the case. Or are you saying that you would say one factor is dominant? The, the factors then get put into the, the weighing scales to test the balance. And that's where those factors need to be assessed one against each other. So, so if you have... So you're not suggesting that anything, the starting point is that any one factor no. has, is, has Abs priority? Absolutely not. That's exactly what I'm not suggesting. It seemed to be what the Secretary of State is suggesting. I consensus trumps all. Now, I accept, and I'll come on to margin, I accept that consensus is potentially relevant to the question of margin. But when you are looking at the question of the balance, the fair balance to be struck. Those four factors in Goodwin, three factors are identified here, neither of them take immediate priority. The question is the balancing between the rights of the individual and the impact on the state, the rights of the state, if you put it in that way. Now, Sir James says he doesn't want to get sucked into an invidious debate on the impact of the passport policy which we challenge in these proceedings on the appellant. But at no point did Sir James submit that her position falls below the threshold for consideration, uh, below which the uh, applicant in Scherner 
So as we understand it, the Secretary of State does not dispute that there is an adverse impact, as described by the appellant in Per's statement. And the simple fact we say is that prior to Goodwin, trans persons were actually better off than the appellant for the simple reason that a trans person was able to have a passport issued in their acquired identity with a minimum of formality. And that is what is being denied to the appellant. So when one seeks to make a comparison, and that is what the Strasbourg court tends to do, to say, well, it's not quite the threshold to, to meet uh, the, you know, the level at which a failure to comply with a positive obligation comes into play. We say that actually the appellant, so far as the day-to-day -day activities, is far worse off than Christine Goodwin, and actually more akin to the situation of B in the B in France case that I took uh, my lady my notes to. So far as the passport application is concerned, can I just hand up um, some very diligent um, person has found a hard copy. Oh, and some even more diligent person has found photocopies of them. was asking the question in relation to the declaration. We've I was just wondering if somebody was going to give us the answer to that. Yes. Well, I, I'd like to pretend it was me who'd done the network, but actually it's those behind who... Well, kudos to those who found it anyway. Thank you. Get collective. <coughs> uh, the uh, front of the... This is a, obviously a hard copy application form. The front page at section 2 uh, requires you to tick the box either male or female, or I'll cross it, and uh, you see to the left-hand side where it says avoid delays, your personal details at section 2 must match what's on your supporting documents. If they don't, tell us why and check the guidance booklet for documents. So you must cross X or Y, although we accept that if you do not, the default position is the supporting documents that you put in. On the back page, section 9 is the declaration. And that is, as I... I think my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson pointed out, it, it is a criminal offence to make a false statement to get a passport. If you make a false statement, you can be prosecuted and go to prison. Uh, and he points out the work and please checking the counter signature is genuine. And so one sees the declaration, which includes at subparagraph six, as far as I know, all the information I've given in this application is correct. Is we then get into the difficult areas, we don't we about whether it would in fact be a criminal offence. Ironically, in circumstances that her finds her in, namely, there is no, uh, so far as the law is concerned, there remains F. Yes. And I, I, so, by <coughs> filling in the form, arguably, there would be no criminal offence. No. I, I, I pointed out to fill in the blank, as it were, that it was left by my Lord Justice Henderson's. <coughs> questions but as I've said we accept that if you don't fill in the, the box the evidence is that effectively it will be filled in for you by the individual um, and even if who you, receives even it. Even if the person felt that, that they couldn't do that which I think per set on the statement to that something to that effect I, I couldn't do that I didn't want to do that. So filling in F even though it, in Per's heart would feel that that was a misrepresentation yes. at legally no, and that's so right. whether Per fills it in or the government fill it in because it's left a blank, there is in fact no criminal, in particular circumstances this case, no. there's no criminal offence. Because Per's gender identity is, is self-identified Is self-identified, exactly. And, and this is the distinction that I've always sought to draw between the civil status question, which arises from the birth certificate and the passport. So I simply... As we're no, the we wanted to know, and I'm grateful, exactly. but I then just wanted to work it through in my yes. mind to think what the consequences of that declaration were, and I think I'm yes. probably right about that. So far as the online form is concerned, that is at Supplemental Bundle, uh, tab 48, page 307. 
have again. These 47. 47. Oh, sorry, 48. 48. So supplemental bundle, tab 48, page 307. <laughs> whether the evidence quite works in terms of making an application and then the other person at the receiving office fills in the blank. As we understand it, uh, this form requires you, you can see at the top underneath the rubric above the first hole punch, who is the passport for, the little red, I hope you have colour-coded versions as well, the little red asterisk, asterisk is required information and then just below the second hole punch is gender, which is one of the items that's required information, male or female. As we understand it, you wouldn't be able to go through to the next page unless yeah. you ticked one of those yeah. boxes in the standard way. Uh, am I, then, Virginia, Mr. Mountford points out that a person could apply, in principle, for a British passport who had uh, an indeterminate birth certificate were they to have a birth certificate from overseas. So there may be situations, not in the case of this appellant, but there may well be situations where actually the application form, whether the hard copy or the online version, simply didn't accommodate that individual. So a different issue might arise there, because there you would have a situation where a person's nationally recognised civil status was indeterminate, a European situation, which is possible, um, but nevertheless the form wouldn't allow for it and the issuance of the passport wouldn't allow for it equally. But I simply put that out as an example of the other difficulties well, that may arise. Well, then you've got to tie that in, don't you, with when was that law passed in reality, practical purposes, against uh, Sir James's argument that they need time to look at all these complicated matters, which would no doubt include the impact of European law on, on, on how the boxes are fixed. Well, we simply say that at the moment it's quite feasible that a person with an indeterminate birth certificate might apply for a United Kingdom passport. Now, there isn't any evidence on how that would be dealt with, but it's difficult to see how it would be dealt with within the M&F boxes. We, we simply raise it in the context of uh, trying to understand how the application <coughs> works, but it's something that perhaps it makes it clear that it isn't quite so straightforward, even at the moment, as how it's dealt with. Can I move to margin, um, on which the majority of uh, Mr Reedy's submissions were made? In relation to margin, I have never sought to argue that margin doesn't apply to whether the positive obligation arises. Indeed, I specifically took the call to paragraph 71 of Van Cook, which makes the point that it applies both at the question of the, whether the obligation exists, and then separately, the question of the implementation of the obligation. I also took the court probably more times than the court wished to be taken to, to Hamelin and Finland. And paragraph 66, which deals with whether it arises, and paragraph 67, which deals with implementation. But what I do say about margin is, one cannot consider the margin in any particular case without looking at the actual facts and matters involved in the case. For example, the margin determines on whether what is being sought is broad or narrow. And that is at um, Hamelin at sorry Hamelin again at paragraph sixty six. I don't ask the court to turn it up. Probably everyone could chant it off by heart at this point. So one can't simply identify in the abstract how the margin of appreciation would apply in Strasbourg in a particular case without looking to what is being sought and by whom and the particular nature of the right relied upon. Now, for understandable reasons, Sir James emphasises, what he says is that we, we don't get off the ground effectively, he says, because we don't have enough other countries on our side. That is, member states of the Council of Europe. We do entirely agree with my Lord Lord Justice Irwin's um, characterisation of our position and that of Human Rights Watch, which is there is a strong and rapidly developing consensus, and, and we do... Well, I've written down as consensus, but whether you call it a trend or a consensus, but we say a trend, well, it begs the question of what well, the consensus I, I, I actually is. I was distinguishing between two. Yes. I was saying oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's my typing in that case. On, that there was yeah. a strong and developing trend. Yes. I'm sorry, but the question is, for this court, is that enough? 
Is it enough for there to be this strong and developing trend, or do you need more? Do you need a consensus? Now, my Lord Justice Henderson pointed out the, the vagaries and the total lack of imprecision on what a consensus actually means, uh, at least to the Strasbourg Court. But it's worth going back to the decision in AP and France, please. That's at bundle C, uh, tab 43. And the court was taken to uh, the uh, analysis in relation to marginal appreciation in particular from paragraph 121 through to 125. And of course what this court recorded at paragraph 124 is that the condition in question had ceased as the sterilisation condition ceased to be part of the positive law of 11 contracting parties, including France, and similar reforms were under discussion of contracting parties, uh, referring to paragraph 71 above. Can I just invite the court to turn back to paragraph 71? Because, I, I needn't read it out, but paragraph 71 makes it clear that there is a clear majority still in favour of sterilisation amongst member states. And just one can see within the, the lengthy paragraph 71, just by the second hole punch, it points out that the number of member states in which recognition is not subject to a legal requirement to undergo sterilisation is 18, 19 in Europe, counting Belarus, compared to 22 countries in which it is. So you still have a majority of countries in favour of sterilisation. So the consensus need not even be past the halfway tipping point well, for the court. I wondered if that's what you were going to say, but I thought what you were saying initially yesterday was that even where you don't have a consensus, if the rights are yes. involved are yeah. central enough, then the court can or should appropriately say that the Absolutely. I have a number of levels to my argument. Absolutely. My, my first level is consensus is not quite so straightforward as it may have appeared. And when one looks at the paragraph 71 combined with paragraph 124 and 25, it's important to record that it was a minority rather than a majority at that point. But I do rely upon, exactly as my Lord anticipates, I do rely upon the point which is consensus is not a trump card. It doesn't simply mean if you don't have the consensus, however one defines consensus... Uh, you know, that there is no positive obligation. Now, my um, learning friend, uh, Sir James, took you to Sheffield and Horsham. Um, we think that the, the reading of Sheffield Horses is, isn't quite right. Um, that's a tab, tab 59A at the same bundle, right at the back. It was one that it was inserted uh, by the respondent. My Lord will see that the paragraph that uh, Sir James referred to is paragraph 59. Now, just to put that in context, at paragraph 58, the court considers whether or not to depart from its decision in Reese and Cossey and conclude on the basis of scientific and legal developments the respondent state can no longer rely on a margin of appreciation to defend its continuing refusal to recognise in law a transsexual's post-operative gender. And it says, for the court, it continues to be the case uh, that transsexualism raises complex scientific, legal, moral and social issues in respect to which there is no generally shared approach among the contracting states. So that's, as it were, the Secretary of State's position. But paragraph 49 addresses the different question that my Lord Justice Irwin puts, which is the B and France approach, which is an alternative approach in this case, which is, nor is the court persuaded that the applicant's case histories in other words, the personal circumstances of the applicants, Sheffield and Horsham, demonstrate that the failure of the authorities to recognise their new gender gives rise to detriment of sufficient seriousness as to override the respondent state's margin of appreciation in this area. And that goes back to B and France. So we entirely 
accept that if consensus is, as we're defined at a higher level than the strong and continuing international trend, if that is defined at a higher level than that, we have difficulty, if it's just relating to member states, difficulty meeting that consensus test. But that isn't a complete answer to our case, because the separate question is, does the failure, in that case of Sheffield and Horsham and in B, to recognise a new gender give rise a detriment of sufficient seriousness? And we do say it's highly germane that the situation in France was not the same as the United Kingdom, and that was the basis for the court distinguishing between the case of B and the, the case of Reese that came before it. If I could just ask the court very briefly just to go back to B it's the, the um, tab 30 and just to emphasize again this B did not contain any consideration of whether there was or wasn't a consensus in member states and just to put the timing of the decisions into context, Reese is in October 1986. And B is in March 1992, so 10 years before Goodwin, but six years after Reese. And of course, in Reese, you've seen the point taken, which is, well, there isn't a, a consensus. Everyone's doing their own thing. Margin appreciation, United Kingdom falls within it. And that consensus had increased, and then the margin appreciation had, the window had closed <coughs> in good way. But here in the middle of that, B and France, the court doesn't even consider the question of consensus. The court considers it from the starting point of the impact on the applicant. Because nowhere in this analysis does the question of consensus arise. And one knows that the court looked back at Rees, because, for example, paragraph 63, they specifically refer back to the Reese judgment. But the key difference was the day-to-day -day lived experience of B. And that, as I've taken you to, the, the Commission's point on that is at page 1249, just by the first whole punch within paragraph 69. And the court agree with that analysis. <coughs> so consensus is not and cannot be a complete answer to the, the balancing question, the fair balancing question. In B, the court balanced the inconveniences as they're described, but it's the impact on the applicant against the burden on the state. And of course, we make a, a trite point, which is the reason that balance came out a different way to Reese is because in Reese, as I started, as it were, much earlier, in Reese yesterday, as I pointed out, a transsexual person could have documents such as a passport issued in his or her acquired gender. And that's the distinction between Reese and B. And well, maybe you're not that sure that when both Reese and B were decided, the nature of the Strasbourg jurisdiction, indeed some of the arrangements that surrounded were quite different. Now, don't you need to, if you're going to make those arguments, you need to look at the more recent restatement by the Grand Chamber in Hawaii. Sorry to go back to that, but that is intended to be a summary of the approach. And the language in paragraph, you tell us we should have it by memory. Well, 66. I didn't say you should, I suspect that you, you already do, but 66 and 67. It's those of us who forget what they did yesterday. Anyway, I spoke, I, I can it, see it's forgettable. You've got to grapple with the way the Grand Chamber has them, have themselves formulated. I do, I do, but I make the point in relation to Hamanainen, which is, there are two paragraphs, 66 and 67. 67 is concerned with implementation, but the distinction there drawn, even according to the Grand Chamber's characterisation, isn't quite so straightforward. And that is actually common ground between myself and Sir James, because some of the points made under 67 actually go to the question of the positive obligation rather than the implementation. But the, the point that is made in 67, in any event, is that... Um, Malone, sorry to interrupt. My learned friend is leaving B in France, and to save me a rejoining, as it were, can I just invite you to put a sideline next door to paragraph 45 
of B. Of B. The suggestion is that B indicates some different approach that doesn't refer to consensus. And I invite you to therefore note in power 45 the arguments that were in fact run for distinguishing the position in Rees. And can I also invite you to note in particular the final subparagraph of 48, including the final sentence of 48. Para 45 to see the arguments actually run, and para 48 including specifically the final sentence. Sorry, I'm looking at the right thing. Not these because of power I'm wondering. It's so terribly confusing. They, they get numbered twice because you have the commission decision as well as the court's decision. So if one starts at 1256 is the right paragraph, 45. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> totally lost. Just let the slow end of the bench catch up. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> So if one starts at page 1256. Five, five, right, that's 45. Five, it starts Miss B argued. That's yep. right. That's right. And Miss B's argument, you can see, was new scientific, legal and social elements yep. and the fundamental difference between France and England. So they were two separate arguments. And her first argument is dealt with between paragraphs 46 and 48. Yes. And her first argument is rejected. Final sentence of 48 yes, I... <laughs> The word consensus undoubtedly appears. But it <laughs> doesn't you. determine the question because they then move on at two, yes. between the two whole punches from paragraph 49, to consider the differences between the French and English system. So the point that I made remains good despite Mr. James's, um, Sir James's um, intervention, which is that. The lack of a consensus did not stop the court finding that there was a positive obligation which had been breached. So the analysis, which was successful, was not based on consensus. And that is the point, and that is the point when I answered my Lord Lord Justice Irwin's point, which is I think there are two different approaches. One based on consensus, and the other based on the second argument run by the uh, applicant in B, successfully. Impact. Impact. And that is not dissimilar to the point in AP and France, to which I was about to go. Because in AP and France, not only, I'm sorry I should have done this in, in one go, but not only is it the case that there was a majority in favour of sterilisation within member states, But that the finding that firstly there was a narrow margin of appreciation and then that a fair balance hadn't been struck is based on paragraph 123, that is the essential aspect of the individual's intimate identity. Now, of course, I accept that in AP there were two elements of identity at play. One was because it went to physical integrity, and the second was the uh, general, uh, because the, the applicants, sorry, the applications concern individuals' gender identity, and they set out their pretty and von Cook and Schlumpf. And they say this finding leads it to conclude the respondent state had only a narrow margin of appreciation. Now, the Secretary of State's position appears to say, well, actually, if you take away physical integrity, you go back to a wider margin of appreciation. It's something of a concertina, isn't it, the question of appreciation it gets as well wider and narrower as you play off each factor against each other. Uh, we simply don't accept that that's right. We accept that there was another factor in play, but we don't accept that of itself there is a narrower margin because of the, uh, the nature of the fundamental right in issue, that is uh, the fundamental importance of personal autonomy and an individual's gender identity within that. And so James uh, took you also to paragraph 127 to note that uh, medical treatments were protected by Article 3. I just make the point that paragraph 127 and onwards, that's dealt with under the question about the fair balance. That's not going to margin of appreciation. Mm 
So we do say there are two roots through. We say that on a fair reading, the clear and developing uh, international, including within member states, trend uh, is and should be sufficient, but in any event, the impact on the appellant is equally sufficient because per is in the same position effectively as B. And the Secretary of State hasn't sought to distinguish Per's position from B, and I made that clear yesterday, that our position is that a trans person, pre-Goodwin, was actually in a better position because they could get a passport and other identifying documents in their acquired gender. But Per cannot obtain those documents in Per's gender identity. The situations, as demonstrated by B in France and the United Kingdom cases, therefore may be very different because that's why you have to look to what the individual applicant is seeking and what the position is. So it isn't enough to say that in Goodwin, in Rees, the court had the wide margin appreciation which it rightly then found until Goodwin uh, to be satisfied, but consensus by the time of Goodwin said it wasn't satisfied. Because always in that Reese and the Cossey and the Sheffield cases, those individuals always had a number of identifying documents, including passports, which did reflect their gender identity. And we say it's critically important then not to think, well, we fall into the same category as those applicants in Reese and Goodwin. And we say that it's too simplistic to suggest that just because the court finds a positive obligation in one case to say that it then rolls out consistently across all member states. Um, my learned friend took you to Schalk, um, just for the court's reference given the time. But paragraph 105 was in relation to a margin of, of appreciation in relation to the timing of the introduction of legislative changes. <laughs> And in a subsequent decision of Oliari, and that's at uh, tab 42 of B, and again, if I might just give the references to this, the complaint there was equally in relation to not being permitted to enter into a civil union, which was said to be a violation of Article 8. And at paragraph 165, we draw the court's attention to the court noting it had already acknowledged that um, in the Italian situation, due to, for example, size of the population, there was no prevailing community interest. So the particular situation, not only of the individual applicant, but also the state concerned, may determine whether or not a positive obligation arises. I've so far then dealt with the margin of appreciation. We may be forgiven for thinking we are already in Strasbourg, because, of course, the margin of appreciation does not apply directly in this court or these courts in this country. We do rely upon the DSD case, uh, uh, that's um, bundle authorities A2, tab 19874. And we do also rely in this context upon uh, Lady Hale's speech in re G adoption, that's bundle A1, tab 6, 199. If there is a clear and consistent line of Strasbourg authority, then we will follow it. Otherwise, if in the margin of appreciation, we'll have to form our own view. The main thrust of the Secretary of State's submissions remains administrative coherence. And in his submissions, Sir James accepts that as a matter of law, passport change could be done without having any consequential and direct effects. Uh, he doesn't accept it doesn't have any consequential that's my note. Again, it might be that I've missed, um, as it were, but my recollection and my define note Define consequential, is, I suppose. Is, is how well, it does it. define consequential because it, it depends upon who is saying what the consequence should be. But in and of itself, just as it didn't in Goodwin, the identification of the sex marker on the passport does not have any direct consequential effects. Now... Sir James describes my position that 
the sex designator can be changed without any necess necessary recognition of a third gender as being unrealistic and selective. Now, I emphasise again, we certainly don't accept that third gender is an apt way to describe non-binary persons, including in particular the appellant who identifies as non-gendered. It isn't the way the government proceeds, and it isn't the, the accurate description in our submission. It's uh, something of a misrepresentation of the position based on the government's own evidence. I, I don't accept I'm being unrealistic. I do accept I'm being selective to the extent that this challenge is only to the passport policy. But well, you, you gave fair warning yesterday that if you win this, <coughs> the, the, the caravan's right, the, the caravan will move on. Well, I, I, I recognise... Well, I, I recognise that this, as it were, may be seen as a battle in a war. But that is not the same as saying we would win any further battles down the line. And that is why I have to look at what is being sought and what the current state of affairs in the relevant state is. Because there may be quite different countervailing factors when it comes to other arguments. So, let us imagine, going back to Rees, that what Rees had wanted was a passport which identified Rees in their acquired identity. One can see that very different considerations would have come into play because Rees <coughs> had a passport, he didn't need to ask for it. But the question of civil status was the question that Rees was seeking. Different considerations may arise depending upon what is being sought. So I am not saying that this if we were to succeed on this appeal, that is an open book to succeeding in relation to chipping away at every other form, because that is a question for another court on another day. So success in this context does not open floodgates in principle, because the court, just as it does in Strasbourg, this court would have to consider the balance between the measure which is impugned and the burden on the state of, of changing that measure and the impact on the applicant in every case. So I can't anticipate what view the court below or this court might take on any subsequent challenge, and it would be quite wrong in my submission to seek to do so. Because Rees had the advantage that he was able to attain a, a document in the acquired gender, which we do not have. So we are at the foothills of these arguments, after 30 years, still at the foothills of these arguments. But it would, in my view, be wrong either to suggest that it is in some way artificial to have challenged this particular measure, or that in considering the merits of our appeal in relation to this particular measure, <coughs> one should take into account the potential for other challenges. And the way you know that it doesn't necessarily follow from having a passport to having full recognition in terms of civil status is Rees. Now, no doubt, Sir James would say, well, in Rees, it was merely a question of identifying an acquired gender rather than putting on a different gender. But it, in relation to passports, it's a question of X for unspecified. And I go back to our same position. We don't accept that. Identifying for unspecified of itself creates a uh, Sir James would put it a third gender, but it creates a recognition of non-binary status. It ultimately <coughs> is for the government, and not, of course, Parliament, because it's the prerogative. It is for the government to consider how the um, application for X status should be dealt with. And as uh, my Lord Lord Justice Sermon points out, as it were, we are uh, neutral on that, save to the extent that whatever is done, it needs to include the appellant, and persons in the, in the same position as the appellant. But the approach of piece by piece is well established in Strasbourg, because in Goodwin and in Rees, it was a change to the birth certificate. Neither Christine Goodwin nor Rees sought to build into that. Well, once I've got my birth certificate, what I want next is the right to have a civil partnership, the right to marry, the right to be identified in a particular <coughs> way on a birth certificate if I have a child. All of those downstream issues were left for subsequent cases many years after the event. 
we don't see there is anything inappropriate or impermissible to challenge this particular measure in relation to the passport policy. And certainly not in some way unrealistic, because we go back to the point made yesterday, which is effectively we are in no different a position to Rees and those in Cossie who came before Goodwin of having a passport in one gender and birth certificate and civil status in another. Now, the importance of the passport, uh, my little friend suggests it's precisely because of the seriousness and regularity of use of the passport, of the passport for identification purposes that it raises broader issues. Just to be clear, as I hope I explained a little yesterday, when I check into a hotel, for example, and if I'm asked for my passport, the person behind the desk is unlikely to check my sex against the sex marker in my passport. It is a form of identity, but not one where my sex is determinative of whether I'm entitled to that particular service or not. I entirely accept that there may be cases where a passport with an X marker is not adequate if, for good reason, a particular institution requires gender identification. And this goes into, and the government recognises it, this goes into a rather more wide-ranging consideration of actually the extent to which gender markers, not just in the context of passports, <coughs> but gender markers are relevant at all. In other words, is government asking for gender markers in situations where they're simply not necessary? And um, I already alluded to um, the appellant's success in persuading RBS to remove gender markers when it came to an application for online banking. But I accept that if for good reason a particular institution required gender identity, I accept that the passport would not be enough for that. Then the appellant would have to show hers birth certificate. And that's why I say that uh, Sir James's suggestion that it's because of the seriousness and the regularity of use that it raises border issues simply doesn't arise because either the sex marker is irrelevant, such as checking into a hotel, or, if it is relevant, then the appellant has to go back to the birth certificate. But on no view does it raise broader issues simply by virtue of the fact that, commonly in a country such as this, where we don't have identity cards, the passport is used as a mode of identification. One has to consider carefully what is required, as it were, what is the identification. It's a name and it's a picture. That is the situation. I entirely accept, and I'll come on to security borders, but just in terms of the domestic use of the passport, that is the limitations on it. Now, Sir James suggests that I can, I can, um, I think I, I can put the saddle to the engine and seek to contain it. Now, I, I'm not sure quite I understand exactly that um, analogy, but what I say is I can certainly argue that an X sex marker in passports does not mean necessarily either that the government has to change anything else. Those are questions for another day. Or it would, of itself, without the government doing anything, change anything else. Because we know that the passport does not affect civil status. My Lord, um, Lord Justice Henderson suggested to Sir James that Goodwin was a self-contained issue. Now, we entirely agree it's a self-contained issue, just limited to birth certificates. And we say that supports our position which is then Goodwin didn't say, and as a result of that, I should be allowed to marry, have children, be defined as a mother or a father accordingly, those sorts of things. But I go back to Rees on that, and just if I may give the reference again, it's paragraph 42 of Rees, because in Rees, the reason for the problems were the necessary wider ramifications. In other words, what followed from the, the um, birth certificate were the reasons why at that point there was still a margin of appreciation, given the nature of the other things that needed to be thought through. Now, Sir James doesn't dispute the existing, long time existing, for uh, at least 40 years, inbuilt incoherence that I identified in relation to trans persons, based on the potential for the sex on their passport and other documents to be different to that on their birth certificate, and therefore not consistent with their civil status. But what he says on that is that's all effectively the more reason for seeking coherence in this case. Well, that argument might be slightly stronger 
if it had ever been suggested that greater coherence was required in the context of such transpersons. But we can imagine consideration was given following Goodwin to what needed to be done. What needed to be done was the Gender Recognition Act, which we know has a very, um, for various reasons, a very low uptake rate. It has never troubled the government, this inconsistency. It doesn't <coughs> trouble it now. There's no evidence of any issue or difficulty. So I do say that it remains a, a fundamental undermining of the importance <coughs> that is submitted by the Secretary of State of administrative coherence in principle. And the court already has my um, submissions on the limited way in which Strasbourg has considered the question of administrative coherence. I can deal briefly, uh, I hope, with fraud and security. Uh, <coughs> Sir James accepts that, and um, the evidence on identity theft <coughs> is concerned with removing the sex marker rather than whether you have an X at the box. Um, we say then there is, there is, as well, no value to be placed on that. It's no good simply saying, well, actually, if we remove the sex marker, security issues would arise. If there's no evidence that security issues arise in relation to X, then the argument doesn't get off the ground. In that context, um, Sir James was asked by my Lord of Justice Irwin about evidence of security problems in relation to Australia. Now, the government haven't disclosed any of the responses. So we are specifically, and I can give... Um, my lady, my lord, the, the reference to the, the document. We are specifically for disclosure of responses uh, when we were in preparation for this. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong bubble. Preparation for this, um, these proceedings because we were very interested to see what governments around the world would say about the X marker. And we were initially told that we wouldn't be provided with those. Um, so I'm so sorry, let me just find the reference to that. And we made a freedom of information request in respect of them. I'm so sorry, yes, I've got it now. It's supplementary bundle, tab 26. So just to put it in context, we have written our pre-action protocol letter back in June 2015. And the response to that, that was at uh, tab 21. I don't ask um, my name, my name to turn it up. The response to that at tab 24. <coughs> and at page 238, <coughs> uh, in paragraph 19, the final couple of lines of paragraph 19, <coughs> we were told that the passport policy team would be seeking update dates this autumn from member states through the ICAO on the use or planned use of X in passports. So this is September 2015. Uh, we wrote in January 2016, that's at tab 26, and at page 244, paragraph 7, We asked for copies of all updates received since the response, in other words, the response the previous year from um, the HMPO to our pre-action protocol letter <coughs> on the use or planned use of pass passports as referred to in paragraph 19. Tab 27, uh, we were told that they, this is the third paragraph just above the second hole punch, but we would not share information supplied to us by individual ICA members. Uh, and suggested we look at the official government websites. Uh, but of course, we weren't asking which countries did or didn't have X passports or how to apply for them. We were interested in whether there were security issues or other issues that were raised. Um, there was then a, a Freedom of Information Act request, uh, which is for your note, tab 31, page 253. Uh, that was also uh, declined. Sorry, that, the, the Freedom of Information request is, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't have a date at the top of it. I think it might be on the index, or someone behind will tell me precisely. 8th of August, 8th of August 2016. 
think you can see at tab 34 that the request was being handled. And I'm so sorry, I don't actually think we've put in the final response to it, but the request was refused. Oh, in fact, I have a complete clip where the court to, to wish for it, or I might just be able to give you the date. The 16th of September 2016. Sorry, 16th. 16th, 1-6. Sorry, in that same year, is that right? Yes, 2016. Yeah, thank you. So we weren't to know at that point that although they said they'd ask for those updates in the autumn of 2015, they didn't actually ask anyone, it appears, until January 2017. <coughs> but it's fair to say that it's against that background that I make the submission that we know that there are at least 20 responses by the time of Mr Woodhouse's statement, but we simply don't know what they say. So any suggestion that there's something in those responses that suggests there's some security issue that was raised, whether by Australia or any other country either which issues ex-passports or has difficulty in terms of receiving people with ex-passports into their territory, we say you must proceed on the basis that there were no security issues raised in those, given the circumstances where we expressly and repeatedly asked for these documents. So James's submission was that even if there wasn't any evidence of difficulties, um, this court should take the view that those countries have just taken greater risks. We find that a difficult submission, particularly against the background of Rees and the fact that effectively this country uh, was allowing people to travel on a passport that didn't match their birth sex for decades beforehand, which gives rise to, in principle, the same risk, the discrepancy between the birth status on a passport and the underlying cardinal documents. So far as border security is concerned, the suggestion is that uh, there are only a small number of people in a small number of countries, and that's why effectively there isn't any evidence of any problems. Um, well, with respect, we don't think that the Secretary of State can have it both ways, because the Secretary of State positively asserts that only a small number of people are involved or who would want an ex-passport in this country. So the fact that there are a small number of people involved internationally really doesn't help when it comes to border issues. There simply is no evidence of border issues. Um, in any event, even if there is this dissonance that's described by Sir James, same dissonance we say as a Rose pre Goodwin, and subsequently for people without a gender recognition certificate, all that that dissonance is is a flag. It's a flag for further inquiries should you be concerned about that particular individual. It is no more than that. On Nicklinson and uh, Reh, we simply make the point that these are both statutory schemes uh, in relation to assisted suicide and parenthood and reproduction, respectively. They were both cases in which the respective legislative scheme had been considered carefully and relatively recently by Parliament. And unlike in Nicklinson, uh, this is not a case uh, where the incompatibility uh, was simple to identify and to cure, and that's paragraph 116, that's authorities bundle 1A1, tab 9, page 433. And it's in that context that um, Mr. Sleeven indicated one should be cautious in relation to the application of the Nicholson principle, so we don't say it assists. Can I just check one Before I move on to balance, can I just crave indulgence for a moment? One case that uh, came to mind, I'll give Ms. Carsfrisk all full credit for it coming to her mind because she appeared in it, is a case of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. We have an extract from it. Now, I'm happy to deal with this in two ways, but it's effectively a point which is where the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, on which Lord Hoffman was sitting, make the point that the um, the domestic court should not effectively be the poodle of, in that case, um, other national consensus. Now, I'm very happy to hand it up, or it might be better for me to deal with it very briefly, if I may, in writing so that Mr. E.D. Sir James, uh, a devote who often, I'm afraid, has an opportunity to reply. No, I think we'd rather do it now. I'm not okay, keen can I, to encourage... Can I hand it up? Um, can I hand it up? Did, 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 did
you want to deal with balance so that Sir James has a moment yes, to digest? Yes, exactly. And that was why I was just pausing so that I could, thank you, take the temperature, as it were. <laughs> well, the temperature is definitely against further written submissions. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> mine too, but <laughs> thought it polite to ask. Well. <laughs> thank you. Um, balance. Um, we respectively agree entirely with my, my Lord Mrs. Irwin. It is um, something that can be done relatively Very simply much. and at relatively little cost in relation to the issuance of an ex passport. Don't confuse to me, that was merely an exploration. Well, a question as posed by my Lord Lord Mrs. Irwin indicated that the premise for that question was it is something that can be done relatively simply and at relatively cost. We say that is simply factually correct, <laughs> uh, and that is the evidence that is before this court and was before the court below. But the balancing factor nowhere in Sir James's submissions took into account the appellant and the impact of the appellant. And we say that that is potentially crucial when one looks at B and when one looks at AP. The two factors that Sir James highlighted were firstly ongoing consideration. Now, I may be corrected on this, but we haven't found any case in which the ongoing consideration, as distinct from the question of consensus, has been put into the balance in Strasbourg. Because I accept, of course, that on one view, consensus is relevant and one looks to it, and one might think that it's to be inferred from that that governments continue to think about what to do. I'm sure some governments do and some governments don't across member states. But it is a quite different suggestion that one can put into this balance a factor which doesn't appear in Goodwin, Hamelinen, AP, any of those cases, which is the government is keeping this under review. And we say that isn't a relevant factor for the purposes of the balance, the fair balance, and I emphasise the word fair again in Strasbourg terms. <coughs> the second point made by Sir James is whether this is the right constitutional body, in other words, whether the court should make this decision or whether it's a matter for um, the Secretary of State. And the point we make there is that it, it is the prerogative power that is in play. It isn't a question of legislation. It isn't a question of going back to Parliament. It only becomes a question of going back to Parliament if the government chooses to make wider reforms. Until then, it is a prerogative power, and we say that is amply within the scope of this court's jurisdiction to review and consider. Can I deal briefly then with Article 14? Uh, just noting in relation to P and PV in Spain, uh, paragraph 29, the Strasbourg Court did find that particular serious, sorry, particularly serious and convincing reasons were required to justify discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. We say the same applies here, both parts of gender identity uh, and identity of self. And in Reg, we make the point, this is at uh, paragraph 48 of the speech of Lord Hope, Authorities Bundle A1, Tab 6, 167, cases about discrimination in an area of social policy will always be appropriate for judicial scrutiny. Now, it's suggested that an analogy with um, Steinfeld doesn't arise because here there are serious and difficult related questions. Um, with respect to, if the questions were so straightforward in, in Steinfeld, then one might have thought the government wouldn't have acted in the way that they did. They wanted to wait and see because they wanted a better evidence base. <coughs> We say we're no different to that. Whether, ultimately, the government should be given time to put matters right, assuming discrimination is upheld and found, that is, differential treatment which is not justified or proportionate, and you have my submissions on those points, is a completely separate question to whether discrimination arises in the first place. And the whole point about the analogy with Steinfeld is that discrimination couldn't be justified because of the wait and see aim that was relied upon by the government in that case. I think I can deal equally quickly as uh, Sir James did in relation to the public law grounds. Sir James admits that the judge got it right so far as relevant and irrelevant considerations were concerned. Well, we go back to, and invite the court to return with care to, paragraph 144, where effectively the judge accepts that irrelevant considerations were erroneously taken into account but they were no longer relied upon by the time Sir James got to the High Court. Uh, we find that genuinely troubling as an approach in the Administrative uh, Law Forum. Sir James's second submission is it's a continuing policy, so it falls to be justified on a continuing basis. Well, that doesn't answer 
whose justification it is. Because it's a troubling feature again, which is who has decided that the policy is justified on that basis? Is it Mr Woodhouse, who stopped doing any work on it as soon as he put his witness statement in? Is it Mr Farmer, who hasn't looked at it at all because he's waiting for the Government Equalities Office to act? Who has made this decision that this policy is justified on a continuing basis? It can't obviously be Sir James. Can I turn then finally to the Court of Final Appeal point? Um, so this is a decision from May 2013. We've given you the extract. We are very happy to give you a fuller uh, version of it, uh, if, if you would like. One can see that uh, the judges uh, included on, the, on page one out of three, you can see they included um, Lord Hoffman. And the, uh, you can see they were represented by Lord, Lord Panic, represented the appellant, and Ms. Cars Frisk represented the respondent, instructed by the Department of Justice. Uh, it concerned an appellant who was a post operative male to female transsexual person who had undergone sex reassignment surgery, and she and her male partner wished to get married, but the respondent refused to celebrate their marriage deciding that she did not qualify as a woman under the marriage ordinance and the matrimonial causes ordinance. Sorry, ordinance. And judicial review proceedings were brought to uh, challenge that point. And uh, one will see that the application um, was uh, dismissed by the Court of First Instance and the Court of Appeal, but the appeal was allowed by a majority by the Court of Final Appeal. And you'll see that the Marriage Causes Ordinance was uh, intended to adopt the English statute, which had formed the part of the, and your, my lord, my ladies would have seen it, the Corbett and Corbett approach, and my lady would be very familiar with that in, in any event. Um, but there was a question about, uh, just at the bottom, about restricting the criteria for ascertaining a person's gender to biological factors, two paragraphs from the bottom. The court held that the relevant provisions in the marriage uh, ordinance and the marriage, marriage matrimonial causes ordinance were inconsistent with and failed to give proper effect to the constitutional right to marry, uh, noting that in denying a post-operative transsexual woman like W the right to marry a man, they effectively and realistically preclude her from marrying at all and impair the very essence of her right to marry. And those provisions were therefore held to be unconstitutional. But then this is the paragraph, and I'll take my lady and my lords to the, the reasoning, whether a consensus regarding a transsexual's right to marry exists among the people of Hong Kong is not a relevant consideration, since reliance on the absence of a majority consensus as a reason for rejecting a minority's claim is inimical in principle to fundamental rights. And we see the reasoning in the decision of paragraphs 113 through to 116 uh, there, which was um, pressed by the registrar, in other words, by my lady friend, Mr. Chris, but without success which is by analogy with the reluctance of the court prior to its decision in Goodwin to declare the Europe, United Kingdom's position on transsexual marriage a violation of the right to marry uh, based on the lack of a European consensus, the Hong Kong court should be <coughs> equally reticent to declare the relevant statutory provisions unconstitutional uh, unless persuaded there's a general consensus against the among the people of Hong Kong in favour of permitting such individuals to marry in their required gender. Uh, it's submitted that there's no evidence of either such social consensus or, and this is what I emphasise, an international consensus among countries which are signatories of the ICCPR. Um, the uh, Court of Appeal did not accept this argument, even assuming that such consensus could somehow be gauged. Um, we do not consider that the practice of the European Court in seeking a European consensus when considering the margin of appreciation has any bearing on the Court's role in interpreting the um, H, sorry, HKSAR's constitution in a case like the present. And it refers to the um, uh, explanation by Lord Roger in Alskany of the European Court's practice and the very different situation of this court, uh, and we say in election to also the, this court, as it were, so the Hong Kong court and, of course, this court of appeal. And then going on, there was a more fundamental objection to the consensus argument. Uh, as stated above, in that we of course accept the basic law in the Bill of Rights are living instruments <coughs> intended to meet changing needs and circumstances. However, it's one thing to have regard to such changes as a basis for accepting a more generous interpretation of a fundamental right, and quite another to point to an absence of majority consensus as a reason for denying recognition of minority rights. Uh, we obviously rely upon that um, statement. Thus, as we pointed out, in its case <coughs> leading up to Goodwin, the European Convention acknowledged that a departure from a position previously adopted, 
involving the upholding of the United Kingdom's then denial of the right to marry <coughs> uh, may be warranted um, in order to ensure the interpretation of the Convention affects societal changes and remains in line. And such a departure involves expanding the reach of the rights of basic societal changes. But reliance on the absence of a majority consensus as a reason for rejecting a minority's claim is inimical in principle to fundamental rights. Uh, and the point is made there by the Chief Justice of Ireland, uh, Murray C.J., who made the point extrajudicially, uh, and there's the reference there to um, a uh, publication by uh, the, the Chief Justice on consensus, concordance, or hegemony of the majority uh, in a publication by the European Court of Human Rights. So without wanting to get dragged into the more philosophical questions that my Lord Justice Henderson raised in relation to the question of consensus, we do simply refer and flag this up, that there is a very clear distinction, we say, between the approach to consensus before the Strasbourg Court and the approach uh, that this court should have to the question of whether consensus uh, matters or indeed matters to the extent that the European Court uh, considers it did. May I again just take a moment to double check um, with my client that there's nothing else... I'm very grateful. Um, it's a point that um, Christy would like me to make very specifically in relation to PERS circumstances. Yes. Uh, and I think it's right that I do, given perhaps the, the lack of Christy's voice that has been heard certainly during the course of today's submissions by the Secretary of State. Um, on behalf of the appellant, um, we note um, Lord Justice Irwin's um, point that the, the caravans are coming, as it were, that, that this is a, a start of a, a wider range. The appellant is 62 years old. Uh, the appellant has found it exceptionally difficult to get this far. Um, there is a very real sense in which any further open-ended delay means that time is simply running out for many of the affected class and delay effectively constitutes denial. Um, the appellant knows that the court will have this in mind but believes it is important for those affected that it is actually said in these proceedings and that the court reflects upon it. I'm very grateful for that opportunity to make that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Unless there are any further questions, those are my submissions on behalf of the appellant. <coughs> Thank you. Now, Sir James, you can come back on the case, of course. Well, I'm very grateful. Three short points, if I may, if you see that I haven't had a chance, obviously, to read the full context of it, nor to go back and refresh my memory of what Lord Roger said in the Al Scaley reference. It's given a lot more thought. But three short points, if I may. First of all, the court's reasoning appears fundamentally to be dependent upon the special position of Hong Kong. And you see the nature of uh, the argument that is being mounted in the latter part of paragraph 113. What appears to have been argued, amongst other things, is that the court should take into account <coughs> whether or not there was a general consensus, five lines up from the bottom of one, one, three, a general consensus among the people of Hong Kong in favour of... That's not the argument at all. But in any event, more broadly, this is plainly about the special position of Hong Kong. The second point flows from 114. And the point that is there being made, if I've understood it correctly, is that there is a distinct constitutional setup in the Council of Europe and the ECHR on the one hand, as compared to Hong Kong and its relationship to the ICCPR on the other. So again, it's about the special position of Hong Kong in contrast to the position in Europe. If the suggestion is being made on the back of paragraph 115 that in some way, shape or form you can only rely upon consensus if you're expanding a right as opposed to ascertaining whether the right exists in the first place, and that appeared to be the implication of my learned friend's submission, <coughs> that is absolutely plumb inconsistent with the now expressly accepted position, which is that under the Strasbourg jurisprudence, the European Court looks 
to the consensus that may or may not exist amongst Council of Europe countries in relation to the obligation in question. And it does so not merely for the purpose of what we've called implementation, but it does so to ascertain the very existence of the right. And my learned friend said in, in her reply that she'd never argued any different. But if you want uh, clear authority for that, we found that you were called in Paris 75 Hammer Lyman. So whatever the position may be in Hong Kong in relation to the point at paragraph 115, before you, you have an accepted position, <coughs> which is that you look to consensus in the Council of Europe for the purpose of determining whether the stage has been reached where the positive obligation needs to be acknowledged. asked you if you wish to apply in relation to your cross appeal. Uh, no, thank you very much. And I should also, seeing <laughs> thank that, you for that, the opportunity. <laughs> I don't, um, Ms. you represent the intervener, but um, as I gather you produced this case and um, have put it before us, I don't, and, and indeed. I, I, I couldn't possibly add to what has already been said by Ms. Gallagher. Very well, thank you. Uh, very well, well it won't come as any surprise to any of you that we are going to reserve our judgments in this matter. And very grateful to all of you um, who've been extremely hardworking and helpful in this very difficult and very important case. I'm, of course, particularly grateful to all those who have um, acted pro bono, uh, but that doesn't in any way detract from the hard work put in on behalf of the government, for which I'm grateful. So the, we will send out our judgments um, in the normal way, uh, initially for typographical and grammatical uh, errors only. It's not an opportunity uh, to re-argue the case or an invitation to treat, um, and we would hope that any other matters can be dealt with in writing. Uh, there's no necessity for anyone to attend at the handout. Thank you all very much indeed.